Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, wherever it is in the world you are joining us. Thank you so much for joining StriveScan's virtual college exploration program. This is in partnership with co the Colleges That Change Lives, and this presentation is specifically the Colleges That Change Lives presentation geared towards school counselors. A few housekeeping items before we begin with today's session. First and foremost, you are encouraged to ask questions throughout this session via the Q&A button that you see on the screen. When you send a question in, it gets sent just to our panelists, and they'll work to answer the question during the session and at the conclusion of the session. They may not get to every single question, so they will receive a transcript of every question submitted today. So they'll also be able to follow up individually afterward as well. As a reminder, your camera and your microphone are turned off. The panelists cannot see or hear you. So if you do have any questions, you should type them in through that Q&A button that you see there. This is one of 50 individual information sessions and panel presentations that are being run through the Colleges That Change Lives uh, programming through Tuesday night. Some of them happened this past weekend, and all of those recordings can be found at strivescan.com slash virtual slash CTCL. There were a few panels this past weekend that were about the college athletic recruiting process, writing your personal statement, digital recruitment and the new landscape of the college search process, the CTCL overview in English and in Spanish. All of those sessions can be found at CTCL or strivescan.com slash virtual slash CTCL. And we're running these through tomorrow evening as well. When you signed up for this virtual program, you did receive a barcode, but you do not need it for this virtual event. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Brooke and Kathy. Great, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us. I know for those of you on the West Coast, like my friend Brooke, it is very early. And so we do appreciate you um, being with us this morning. Um, let me... Let me advance our slides. So I am Kathy Finks. Um, I am at the College of Worcester, but more importantly, I've been a CTCL board member for the last four years. And so this is something that is very near and dear to my heart. And so hopefully today we can have an open discussion and have a lot of time for Q&A at the end. Hi, I'm Brooke Yoshino. I'm Director of College Counseling at Flipper Charbonnery School in California. Um, I am on the other side of the desk, but also feel really strongly about CTCL and I'm really proud to be part of this group. Um, I've served as a board member for the past two years. Great. So we are going to lead you through today, um, defining CTCL a little bit, um, kind of talking through the history and, and where we are currently today. Um, dispelling hopefully some myths, these are things you hear all the time. And then um, talking through tools, um, things that might um, come up in conversations, challenge, um, challenge students in a new way, and kind of look through um, what, how can CTCL partner with you. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Brooke. Wonderful. Thank you, Kathy. So CTCL um, is a nonprofit organization that was uh, born out of the work done by a man named Lauren Pope. Um, he was a retired educator, um, editor, and journalist with the New York Times who also went on to become a college counselor. And he, Lauren, like probably a lot of us on the counseling side, became a little disconcerted with the constant talk about applying to the top schools. And um, the, the top schools are awesome and they're wonderful, but they may not always be completely appropriate for that student. So um, grounded in, the, in a belief that the college admission process should really be student-centered with the goal of helping students find colleges that help them to develop a lifelong love of learning, as well as providing a foundation for successful and fulfilling um, life beyond college, uh, Lauren set out to uh, do some research. And from what I understand, he and his wife traveled around uh, the nation, um, spent a lot of time at many colleges, um, informally talking to students and faculty and staff, and gathered up uh, the original group of 40 schools that he highlighted in his book called Colleges That Change Lives. And um, so what we wanted to do um, as a CTL was started as a way to continue Lauren's work um, in an effort to do a couple of things, which is to bring down the stress level surrounding college admissions, because as you know, that has just ramped up and up and up over the years. Um, as an organization, we also serve as a resource that advocates for the liberal arts. 
Um, we support our member colleges and we encourage students and families to look beyond the rankings. Um, so like I said, um, I'm a board member and when I applied to become a board member, I stated that at least one copy of CTCL is on my shelf at any given time. One for reference and then one in case a family or a student is really interested, I can hand it, I can loan it to them. Uh, that may or may not have gotten me the job, I don't know. So, um, you know, I, I just so strongly believe that um, college is really a match to be made and not something as a prize that you put on your shelf. And I just felt, I feel CDCL really supports me in my efforts in, in getting that message out. So, next screen. All right. Oh. Next one. So CTCL is comprised now of 45 colleges and universities. Um, the vast majority, 43 of them, are private schools. We've got two schools that are um, public. Uh, they uh, are encompass, they're located in 25 different states around the country. Um, and then average enrollment of the schools is about 1,500 students. So um, as you can see, with an average enrollment of 1,500 students, these schools are small in size, but big in impact. Here's just a list of the schools that uh, are included in CTCL at this point. Um, some of them you may have heard of, and others, honestly, before I became a counselor, I, I didn't have a lot of experience with. But the CTCL really does a great job of exposing um, students, families, and counselors to these schools that are um, very diverse in their range, and but all offer this core experience of strong liberal arts and student-centered um, education. So just a couple of highlights about CTCL's history. So, um, after his extensive research, um, Lauren published the first book, um, the first uh, uh, version of the book, edition of the book in 1996. And then a couple of years later, the school started to kind of band together the member original member colleges to do some collaborative work. How do we get the word out collectively that we are in this book and we um, believe in this type of education? Um, Lauren did the last revision of the book in 2006, and in the same year, um, Colleges That Changed Lives nonprofit was founded um, with the original founding 40 schools um, to kind of consolidate the advocacy and support um, that's, that the work continues, the organization continues, continues to do today. So the fourth edition of the book um, was a, um, a revision done by Hillary Maisel Oswald, and it, it added four new schools um, to the book. And then two years ago, Bard College also joined the nonprofit. Great, and um, I'll just add here that really it's that collaboration with the schools that's really transformed this organization, not just from being a book, but being an organization that really believes in what we're doing, right? These are all schools that are here to help students um, look beyond um, some of the main factors that they might initially uh, have thought of. And um, it's that collaboration that also pulls us together and, and helps us as organizations, even within our own admissions office with certain practices. And so um, it is a pretty strong organization that um, believes in partnering and we travel together and we present um, together, even if it's just eight schools or five schools at a time, because our missions so closely align often. And, um, and it's, that, it's that belief that we're looking um, beyond just um, some of the things that we've heard of, right? So as I'm going to have Brooke chime in here from time to time as we go through these next steps, but it's all those little things about dispelling myths, or as I like to say, really on your job, promoting the positives. And um, some of these, I know that they're things that you deal with on a daily basis. 
Um, and, and how do we, as an organization, how can you say, hey, here's some schools, here's you know, 44 schools that you can really look at to get started. Um, and so the first one is really name brand. So this is something that I know as college counselors you often struggle with. And it, and it can be a national name brand thing, a name brand like, oh, these are the name brand schools. But it also can be very regional. So for my counselors who are working in the Midwest or working on the West Coast, it can be that regional pull of that name brand school or that state school. Um, and so how do, you, how, do you, how do you start those conversations about um, who the student is sitting in front of you? Um, hopefully, as you're starting those conversations about um, looking at schools and, and looking beyond the names, you're really getting into what Brooke just described as the core of our organization, right? So the core meaning, what is that fit? Um, how are you going to help the student find that fit? What does it mean to match those? Um, it's not just the end goal with that student, um, hopefully, about sitting in front of you, but really it's about the end goal of what you're going to grow and learn and experience. And so how do you how do, you do that, right? Um, and so it's things like asking the student uh, who you are as a learner and really asking, you know, not just, okay, I like this or I get straight A's, but how do you learn best? How have you engaged in a class that you really liked? Well, how, how has that shaped you? Um, what types of things excite you? Um, again, what, what is your end goal? If your end goal is just to get into that name brand school, okay, but then what? And just helping that young person really understand what goes into selecting a college um, can, can really be important. And so this theme of of that, that match and, and um, that pursuit beyond um, just getting into college, you'll hear in all in, in throughout the presentation today, and it doesn't just end with this name brand school or not. Um, but again, I think Brooke said some, when, even when she was a counselor, some of our schools weren't just on the tip of your tongue, but when you start to dig in to what our schools are offering and how nationally they are known amongst graduate schools and um, fellowship programs and, um, all types of industries, you're going to see that it's, it's really amazing that somebody sitting um, at home, not really exposed to higher education beyond a state school or an Ivy League, um, what our schools have to offer. So uh, Frank Bernie, who many of you may know, you can, I'm sure you've read the quote as I've been talking, but it's really, um, from the Gallup survey, is really talking about what things help students fare better. And this will come through time and time again, but it is about developing relationships, a mentored relationship, taking on a project, a lasting um, project, it might be a semester, it might be a year long thing, it might be a, a mini term. Um, did they connect through a job or an internship in their chosen field? Did they have a deep connection with an activity uh, or an organization on campus? Not just minimally spread out, but really um, diving into things. Um, and, and this, you know, as students start to think about what's it really going to be like in college, I think this really, um, this, this starts to open up that conversation. And, you know, we'd be welcome to hear from you if you have um, suggestions for other counselors, really how you've kind of approached this. But it leads into who are we, right? So the schools that are in this organization, they're all small schools. And you, and you struggle, I think, sometimes with that, too. <laughs> What does that mean? I don't want to be in the same size high school. Well, you know that being in the same size high school is not the same. But what does it mean to really have that love and that value for a small, a small liberal arts school? Um, it's some of the things that are on here, right? So it's that student faculty connection. I think sometimes they really understand, you know, at a high school that's been a very different, but they've all had one teacher or one faculty member that they really, really um, enjoyed that class and it's, it's excited them in a way, even if it was chemistry and chemistry is not their field, right? And so, in, you know, in a small school, it's just what we do, it's abundant. And you're going to have those student faculty connections. If you think about it from the faculty side, they're choosing to be at a small school. They want those connections. They're not choosing to be at a school where they're going to be in a lecture with 300 and then go and do their research only. Um, it's about being that active learner, which we talked about when you're looking at those name brand schools too, but really being somebody that you can come in and make a difference. Um, and we'll talk about that and how it relates to the science field really specifically in a second. 
Um, it's about hearing feedback. You know, sometimes that isn't a high schooler's favorite thing, but as you and I and every working adult knows, that's really important to being able to move forward in a field. So learning how to have feedback, what, you know, how does that, um, how does that help you, not just for right now, but in the long term? Um, increasing those opportunities for research and, um, and educational opportunities in general. And I think sometimes uh, when you hear research, you think just science, right? But it's not just science. It's about an educational opportunity for research in the education field. You know, being able to go out and maybe look in the Cleveland School District about the lack of funding and how, how you can help that. Um, or it's about being a writer and, and looking at, um, I want to go work at a, a magazine for female athletes in Atlanta. And how do I, how, how can I take that research that we're looking at and bring that back into the classroom? And so those are just abundant in small schools. And I think sometimes you think the opposite, um, that you know, they're, just, they're just for um, the, the bigger schools. It's about communication. I think I could get a raise of hands, but what is probably one of the most important factors in your career, communication, right? It's whether it's in person, written, one-on-one, Zoom now, um, small groups, large groups, um, but it's, it's, you enhance that at a small school because it, communication skills are such a part of our curriculum at a liberal arts school. Um, it's such a part of, um, you know, learning to write, whether you're going to be a mathematician or an English major or sociology. How do you get your ideas expressed and heard? Um, cooperation um, and also the respect for, for talents and learning in a different way. I think right now um, in, in a lot of the social movements that are coming up, small liberal arts schools whether they're name brand or on our campus is in Iowa, we're the ones that often are making those transitions and, and movements. And why? Because we are small, because we can band together, because we can hear each other over the noise of so many students on campus. And we're, the, we're a lot of times the ones who are making those grassroots efforts that really take hold and stick. And so helping your students just look at why a small school is so important and why that's really gonna transform them. Um, really becomes important. And, and I kind of touched on this a little bit, right, in my sneak preview of what was to come, but can you pursue science at a liberal arts school? No. Yes, of course you can. I mean, it seems, it seems crazy, um, but I think sometimes students really don't understand what that, that, that could look like and what that can mean. Um, I think, you know, all you have to do is, is look at what Steve Jobs said. Um, about technology and, and the birth of where we're going. And he said, and, and I should have put it up here, but I'll just read it to you, that technology alone is not enough. It's technology married with the liberal arts, married with the humanities, that yields the results that make our hearts sing. And I think that um, when he's, you know, when we're looking at the next generation of people that are going to be able to lead those science fields, those tech fields, it's people that like the slide before said, can communicate, can take feedback, can collaborate, um, can hear each other. Um, those are the things that really make science work, right? Um, it, I think every, I don't know, I'm gonna go on a limb here, but every major um, scientific breakthrough, you've had to take that thought and get it to paper, get it to research, get it into the lab. And how do you do that? You have to be at a school that promotes that. Um, you have to be at a liberal arts school that that's where we're, we're on the cutting edge of getting students in the classroom, helping them lead their own research, getting them into labs um, beyond their graduate fields, you know, not having um, not enough lab space for all the students on campus. But that's the cornerstone. If you look at how our buildings and our campuses work is um, having them in and amongst their faculty learning that collaboration is so key. It's so important. And um, our collection of CT sales schools, we thrive in that. I mean, that's, that's where we are. You can see the list of the success, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, but I think, again, it's helping students really understand that if you want to be exposed to early opportunities for research before you apply for graduate schools, before you apply for doctorate programs, um, getting in at a CT cell school and really being able to do that, um, I think, speaks for itself. I think the other thing, if you do, if you start to look at PhD productions amongst liberal arts students and look at where CTCL ranks, it is 
extremely impressive. And so um, helping them understand, again, it's not the end goal as I started the conversation, it's not the end goal to just stick it into college, but where's this, um, where's this really going to take you? Um, how are you going to be able to innovate? If you have a student sitting in front of you that um, likes tinkering, likes being able to think, likes being able to ask a question, um, that, that's what we're talking about here and absolutely you can do it. Um, can I jump in? Other myth. Oh, go ahead, Brooke. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, you know, just from the college counseling perspective, you know, we have students and families that come to us that um, have a lot of preconceived ideas. I know in my, at my particular school, I have, a, I'm dealing with a lot of um, students whose parents are, um, were not educated in the US. And so the big names are the ones that they've heard about, whether from famous alumni or sports or you know, whatever it is. And so I think it's my job as a college counselor to really bring up these, these other aspects of these pieces to try and get them to think a little bit more broadly beyond the schools that they've only heard of. So, um, you know, another thing that I like to talk about in terms of school size, um, a lot of my students were a very small school. The average grad graduating class is 100 students. And so their knee jerk reaction to me is I want to go to a big school. I'm tired of being in a fishbowl and knowing everything about everybody. So they automatically want to go to the largest school they can find without really realizing or thinking about you know, what does that mean for the way they learn and the kinds of interactions they are going to have or not going to have. Um, from my point of view, I also worked in admissions at a small liberal arts school. You know, they say, well, I want to go to a large university so I can do research. And my question and, and kind of offering to them is just because you're at a large school doesn't mean you're going to get that research opportunity. There's going to be a lot more competition. Um, it may be reserved for grad students, whereas at these liberal arts schools, like Kathy was saying and what I've seen, is students really get to create their own original research or jump in and help a professor, they oftentimes get published before they even graduate. All of these things I think are easier to facilitate in a smaller environment and um, certainly at the schools on the CTCL list, this is something that they, they pride themselves on. Great. Yes, and you live in Tech Haven, so absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so one of the other things is, rather than think of it as cost, which I know comes up a lot, but really helping students reframe their thinking into what's my return on investment. And so um, one of the things that if you look at the, what makes the happy, healthy, um, professionals uh, Gallup survey, you'll see that strong correlation. And it's the things we talked about in, in the beginning. And so it's no, it's no coincidence, I guess, that we repeat them here. But it's, um, you know, the odds of stronger agreeing with your education um, and then looking at the outcomes piece um, is, is tremendous. And so what is that return on investment? How can you really enhance your career and how can you make um, yourself known and, and kind of looking through again it's that professional connection it's that about doing research it's about getting involved with an organization again things you can easily do at a small liberal arts school um, here it's also i think when you when you talk about that cost there's this overwhelming press it always happens about this time of year with the debt crisis and and while there is is something to that. Um, I think a lot of the times what they're what what they're quoting, what their um, what their piece and their numbers are about is not exactly um, what you're seeing. A lot of what they're talking about the national debt crisis also includes um, adult uh, returning to finish their degree, um, which is not the same as what we're talking about for undergraduate. And so kind of keeping that in perspective and you can see on here what the average is and where many of our, um, this is just a sampling, but where many of our schools do. I think more important to, um, more important than just talking about the average debt level is really helping students understand, and Brooke, you can chime in here for a little bit, but helping them understand what does it mean apples to apples and not apples to oranges with the cost. Um, you know, CTS sales schools overwhelmingly provide generous merit-based aid. We have to, right? It's, it's part of the, the critical um, 
work that we do and we provide it across the board, right? So it's not just to a select few. It's not just to a select few that first of all get in. We haven't even talked about that, but it's, um, it's about really making sure that if we're going to be in small classrooms, that we have a great mix of students in there. And so, yes, religious diversity and, and uh, ethnic diversity and geographic diversity and diversity of thought, all of those things go in, but so does socioeconomic diversity. And so we wanna have those, those conversations that have a real mix, a real balance of our young learners. And we can't do that without a huge merit component to it. And so when you start looking at the opportunities for scholarships to these schools, they're just abound. I really should change this, this slide to look more at the scholarship levels, I think, at these schools to help you understand that um, we're still giving them to uh, Pell Grant. If you look at the Pell Grant recipients of our schools, um, the percentage that are in a class, um, to the middle class, to you know what is now considered the upper middle class, that um, parent, parents are the FAFSA is saying, hey, guess what? You can afford forty thousand a year, and they're saying, what are you talking about? Um, and so, and so it's really capturing all of those different components of of students and helping them um, really uh, get a handle on on the cost, if you will, or the investment of of the what they're buying for for the um, for the product. So, Brooke, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about kind of what you hear initially with the cost and what you've seen when you're counseling students and families. Sure, I, you know, more and more, um, cost has become an issue that I talk about with more and more families, even at a private independent school like mine. Um, and there is a real concern about, you know, if I'm going to put this much money in, what is, what is my student going to get as, in, you know, in, in return? And, um, you know, aside from all of the benefits of the smaller education, more personalized one-on-one, -on -one, um, you know, when it comes down to looking at the, the number, students, you know, families can be a little frightened off. But, um, especially in a state, the state where I live, I live in California, where we have two really strong state programs, the Cal State and the UC system. And so a lot of times our parents are kind of weighing the option of a good in-state education um, where we're citizens and we get a, a discount on the tuition versus going to a small private school maybe that they haven't heard of. But I encourage families to really look into it because like Kathy was saying, merit-based scholarship can come in and really help bridge the gap between what families can think they can afford and, and what's being asked of them. And it, it's surprising and they're surprised um, when they, their students, if they're particularly strong, may get really generous merit-based scholarship offers that actually bring the cost down to something equal to going to a state school, if not lower than. Um, so our state school system, while it's really strong, we are in a position economically where we don't, there's not a lot of financial aid that is, you know, we can, that the state can give to students. So um, although the tuition is cheaper, sometimes the amount, if they're not offered aid, it's not a possibility for them. So I think in terms of looking broadly, also they need to look broadly in terms of what the, what the cost is is and what possibilities are in terms of need-based and merit-based financial aid and scholarships. I think the other thing that um, to help students, and you never think that when you're sitting in the chair looking at college, it's not going to be me, this is not who you're talking about, but helping students really understand that at these small schools we can pivot really quickly and we can help you pivot really quickly and so if you think you're going in and you're going to be a computer science major but you fell in love with anthropology and marketing, how can I pivot? Um, and, and, and for those students, why does that matter? Why is this part of the conversation on investment and cost? Because at some larger schools, that pivot just doesn't happen very easily. And the graduation rate, um, why does every school in the nation quote oftentimes five year? Because the large state schools often are graduating students at four and a half years or five years because those pivots can't happen. And so that all goes back into the cost and the investment. Um, and so something to kind of keep in mind with your students as they're talking through who they are as a learner, what they want to do, and kind of helping them navigate that, that, that plan or that, um, that outcome. Um, so 
So as we um, kind of wrap up here, and I realize we're getting short on time, and so I just wanted to um, bring up that next thing about why the investment, why does this matter, why is C2 so, so impressive? But if you look at how many, we had 42 Fulbright Scholars in 2019, we had 32 Gelman Scholars, six Watson Fellowships in 2018, and when you go out, because I was like, I want to see who these you know, students were and who we were competing against. If you look at who we've competed against in terms of where are these students coming from, the list of schools goes back to our first slide about the myths is those name brand schools that, you know, where our students are competing and excelling. And part of that is because they've been at places where they've gotten to have a faculty mentor that can write a good relationship or uh, write a good recommendation letter. They've been at schools where they've gotten to ex then exposed to foreign language and being able to use that in their field. They've gone to do research. Um, we're also, we have three of the top producers for Peace Corps. Um, I know those students just came back. How do I know that? Because I had a couple that were of my former interns that were on in the Peace Corps and they've had to come back from their field during the pandemic. But it's awesome to see that we're being recognized. And when we are talking about um, who knows us, here, here's proof. You know, we're, we're so well known. Our students are so impressive and they're, and they're working um, they're working um, at you know those next steps, those next levels. Um, you know, I, and we didn't even talk about the acceptance rate. I think that's one of the things that if you come to a, a, a normal year, you come to a tour, you hear about students so worried about where they're going to be accepted, as the media likes to portray that so heavily. And that's that's exactly right. You know, there are some schools where, especially in Brooks neighborhood, where you know you have six. 7%, 10% and under acceptance rate. And that's, that's really hard. Um, but here, you know, if you look at who we are as institutions, how well our students are doing, how well our students are known, what graduate schools they're getting into, what careers in the tech and industry they're getting into, yet, you know, on average, 65% of the applicants are accepted. Oh my goodness, you know, heaven forbid. Um, those two numbers don't always correlate, but there's such media frenzy around that the two have to correlate. Um, and that's just not true. And, 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 and again, it leads into that investment into the student, investment with those merit scholarships, and investment uh, by the student and the family and, and leading to those outcomes. So um, anyway, I hope that, oh, and I, forgot one click. I hope that you know that this is really, it's not what we're presenting is um, more the norm than is the exception. It's just more widely unknown. So Brooke, do you want to talk about how we've expanded how students can learn about us? Well, so what I, you know, we want to direct you, of course, to the CTL, CTCL site. Um, and we put a lot of time and energy into rethinking how students and counselors can um, in, best interact with the um, search engine. So we really expanded that and enhanced that in a lot of ways. Um, there are a gajillion different search engines out there and um, we wanted to really focus everyone in on the 45 schools that we highlight. And so you could really dig in a little bit deeper and get some good information about um, each of the schools. So you can search by major, by location, by athletics, just like you can on many other search engines, and it'll um, populate the schools that uh, from the CTCL group that have those particular attributes. Um, I think it's really nicely laid out to you to go through and click on any one of the names of the schools and it'll give you some good basic information. Um, and then they also, we've given you the, the ability to, to follow the link to the school's actual website so you can get a lot more information um, as well. We encourage you to, to share this with your families and your students. Um, it's a very good resource for learning more about these, these special schools. And then we are including a little list of um, some other things that can help you in your um, quest to educate uh, your families and your students a little bit more about kind of the value of liberal arts education. Um, of course, our website, National Survey of Student Engagement, uh, Gallup Purdue, um, some great information that Kathy put in about loan debt indebtedness. And then, as Kathy was also talking about the PhD production, um, it's you should take a look and see where the students are coming from that eventually go on to get PhDs in their selective fields. 
Great. And well, then, go ahead. Connecting with us on all the things, um, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, CTCL, at CTCL Colleges. Um, we regularly post information about um, the value of a liberal arts education, different articles and things that come out in, in the news. We also connect directly to stories and um, events on each of the member campuses that kind of highlight the, um, the value of a CTCL college experience as well. Great. Well, hopefully you learned a little bit about our organizations and our schools, um, and we want to be able to answer some of your questions. I just realized I know I'm not sharing my screen. I don't think appropriately. I think you can still see some of my stuff at the top and bottom. Sorry about that. Um, so that being said, I'm wondering if Brooke or if Rachel could come on and let me know what questions are out there and we can try and answer those. Um, and then I would be curious just to the side before we get locked into questions. Um, as we're learning more about CTCL and counselors and we're trying to have those relationships and now that we're in the virtual world, if there's topics moving forward that CTCL can do outreach on with schools so that you can learn more about, maybe it's um, if you want to have just a, comp, uh, just a, a Zoom session on um, how schools are now reading applications without test scores, or if there's other topics that you're really curious about, we'd be curious to know what those are so that we can do future programming. So, sorry, I just want to make sure that you guys have time to answer those. So, Brooke or Rachel, can you share with us the questions? I'm sorry about my screen. Um, so one question, how can a college counselor check the financial health of a college before recommending it? Uh, for example, where can I check out about um, Hampshire College? Did, um, um, I can take that um, and then maybe Kathy, you can confirm this. I usually um, suggest that families go to the, um, the individual schools um, financial aid calculator and put in some preliminary numbers to do, um, see if it falls within the ballpark. Um, I also encourage students to, if they're really interested in school, to reach out to the financial aid office because they're there to help families understand how they do things um, and to give them a little bit more context. Yeah, and I think if you're, you're talking about um, Right now where we are with institutions and dealing with the pandemic and, and what their health. Um, I think when you're on um, on those calls or when you're you're talking directly with the schools, I think it's a fine question to ask. It's a fair question to talk about um, how are, how are we handling um, the storm and and what place what things do we have in place um, with the health of our, our financial um, how do we, with the financial wealth of our college, how are, we, how are we handling the storm? And I think those are, are good questions that you can ask um, individually to schools as well. Yeah, I think one of the questions that's being asked is about um, general financial health of a college given COVID-19 and things like that. Um, I'll let you guys answer and then I also have a little bit I can throw in. Sorry, do you wanna go Brooke or? Well, not just that, I, I don't, I mean, I think that that on our end, on the college counseling end is a big question and it's something that we're thinking a lot about Mm -hmm. um, I know that this crisis has hit every school really hard. Um, some maybe are feeling it a little bit more than others. I know schools that are, you know, strong financially to begin with, even those schools are having to make some pretty drastic austerity measure changes to their faculty, staff, and students. Um, and then schools that are um, less financially stable are, are having to deal deeper than that. So it is something that is a question on my mind as well. Um, and I would actually love to hear from the, co the, co the college perspective, you know, kind of how you guys are thinking about this. Yeah, so um, I will say that um, 
you know, here at Worcester, um, it's, while it came up quickly, it's, it's something that we've been able to spend time thinking about, right, and really make some, um, some adjustments that are still student-centered. And I think that, again, one thing that binds the CT sales schools together is that, by and large, we are student-centered schools, not by and large, we are student-centered schools. And so when we've had to weather storms before, whether it was the uh, 2008 financial crisis or whether it's this COVID crisis, um, I think being small and being, um, being schools that can be adaptive and um, many of us have such large um, donor groups that um, our alumni are fiercely passionate and um, being able to go to them and say, uh, it's no secret, this is a storm and, and how can you help? I think, you know, we've done that, other schools have done that and, and making cuts that are, you know, um, are appropriate um, and things that um, make it so that the students can still have all those one-on-one -on -one experiences, have those collaboration experiences, um, has really has really helped us weather the storm. And I know that from you know our peer groups, I've, I've seen that as well. Rachel, did you say you wanted some, you had something to add? Yeah, one counselor asked about um, how resources that they can look at to um, figure things like this out. Unfortunately, I don't think that there's a central resource that makes it easy, um, which is, you know, unfortunate, but difficult to put together, I'm sure. Um, so I think one of the things that can be useful is we have a link to all of the college's responses up on our webpage, um, so COVID-19 response pages, um, and you can see sort of what they've been doing, and I think that can be helpful. there another question? Um, we received a couple of questions about diversity of the CTCL colleges and also how CTCL schools are advocating for racial justice and supporting activists. Yeah, that's, those are great questions and I sort of tried to touch upon that in the, the, the presentation as well. Um, I think that if you look at our, across the board, if you look at our member schools, um, the, there's, why do you have small schools, right? It's to have interaction amongst your peers and your professors. And again, I stated this, but there's, there's no point in having small schools if you don't have diversity of thought. And so to have diversity of thought and to have diversity represented in many different ways, um, you, you have to look at your, your applicant pool and how you're searching for those names and um, how, how you're admitting those, med admitting students across the board. And so um, that's what we're doing. That's what we pride ourselves in, is having the ability to go in and really um, look at how we can have um, diversity amongst many different factors um, at a small school in those small classrooms. So it's something that we take, um, we're really proud of if you look at our uh, just on sheer numbers. If you look at those, we're you know across the board. I think you'll see a nice trend that doesn't happen um, at a lot a lot of other schools, even smaller bard schools. We're more of um, the outliers in some of those. So even for small small schools like in Ohio or Iowa, I think sometimes those aren't what you think of as diverse havens, right? But they, we are in our um, in our back background too, which has been really nice. So, um, Brooke, has that been your experience as well when you've been working with students? Absolutely. Um, I feel that at a lot of small schools, students feel empowered to use their voices and they're able to bring up these issues that are very difficult within a setting that encourages critical thinking and, um, questioning and pushing boundaries. And um, so I definitely think that the small schools have a, an advantage in allowing students to have a disappear. Um, and so I encourage students to have interests that are concerned about those things to look, look at in, in those terms as well. And then another thing I was seeing uh, some questions about, um, oh, 
we have 60 seconds. I'm going to hold my thing. We'll, we'll get to your questions in the Q&A if we haven't already. So thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Um, we really appreciate you being here and hopefully you learned a little bit about c 2 sales and organization along the way. Like, we, like Brooke said, you can email either any of the three of us um, if you have additional questions, um, concerns. We hope that you'll encourage your students to join the individual sessions and um, I'll turn it back over to, to Zach. Right. Thank you so much, Brooke and Kathy, for sharing this information. As Kathy had said, uh, the students are encouraged to uh, attend the re remaining CTL CTCL sessions that are running throughout today and tomorrow. Those can all be found at strivescan.com slash virtual slash CTCL. You as a counselor can also register for those individual info sessions and panel presentations. There is a link for student registration and a link for counselor registration. And if you missed an individual in uh, information session or panel presentation, we are recording all of those and putting them up very quickly afterward at strivescan.com slash virtual slash ctcl. And with that, thanks everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye.